Welcome to the Gene Food Podcast. I'm your host, John O'Connor. Hey, everybody. It is 2021, and this podcast that is being released on a somewhat irregular basis these days is uh, here for you. We're doing our first show, 2021. There's been a lot going on with Gene Food. Um, we are uh, basically a smaller team, uh, not venture backed, very, very soulful operation. Hopefully that's part of the reason why you like us. And there's a lot of tasks that our that our team has has to do. And so what tends to happen is the podcast gets pushed uh, to the back of the queue for a little while. We have some some great stuff coming up in, in 2021. We're always updating our personalized nutrition algorithm, which is a nutrigenomic algorithm, which divides our customers into one of 20 diet types based on their genetics. Um, and we're also uh, going to be doing some cool stuff uh, teaching uh, health professionals and uh, hospitals and dietitians and physicians um, the new science of nutrigenomics. So we have some stuff that's uh, that's coming down the pipe line with that. There's an um, a awesome new addition to our team, which I can uh, which I'm proud to announce today, which is we're joined by um, Kristen Kirkpatrick. She is the now the chief nutrition officer here at Gene Food. And Kristen is going to be in charge of helping us develop the product and also helping us build out some training programs um, so that we can kind of spread this this knowledge, this uh, nutrigenomic personalized nutrition knowledge far and wide. So Kristen comes to us uh, from the Cleveland Clinic. She has 15 years of experience at the Cleveland Clinic where she was the lead dietitian. And she actually, uh, you know, it's funny, we people that read the blog and listen to the podcast, um, they've seen us and, you know, me write about kind of defending DNA diets and defending some of the studies that have come out around ketosis and um, the different phenotypes of heart disease and um, cholesterol hyperabsorption. And really, there's been a lot of really interesting studies that have come out looking at um, ketogenic diets versus nutrigenomic interventions in uh, the context of weight loss and, um, you know, nutrigenomic interventions have just far, far outperformed uh, ketogenic diet diets in those studies. But there still is sometimes this idea out there that, you know, nutrigenomics and, and DNA diets and tailoring nutrition to, to genetics is in some way alternative. And it's really not. Um, that's not to say that it's the end all be all or that it, that it solves for every single issue because clearly, um, you know, there's microbiome, there's lifestyle, there's sleep, there's all a lot of different factors that go into it. So we, we never want to be dogmatic about, um, about, you know, our product or the role that it plays. It's not the it's not the totality of the circumstances, but it's it's certainly a big big piece to the puzzle. Um, and evidence as evidenced by the fact that they, I mean, they have and have for a number of years used nutrigenomic interventions at the Cleveland Clinic, which is one of the world's best hospitals. Um, so aside from all the data that we compile and all the studies that are out there, if nutrigenomic interventions didn't work, they wouldn't be using them at the Cleveland Clinic, right? And a, and a whole host of other health systems. And that's only going to increase over time. And so we have these these products that are that are coming online, and it has uh, delayed things a bit, um, you know, on our end. So thanks for bearing with us. And this is going to be another solo episode, uh, but uh, in the future we're going to have Kristen on as a regular uh, regular co-host, and we're going to be having some uh, some guests coming on in the near future as well. You know, when you have a business like, like, uh, like I do here at Gene Food, um, you know, we're still emerging, still trying to grow. It, sometimes it's uh, harder to get guests. I mean, sometimes you will email people who you want to come on and you know, we have a decent listenership that's been growing, but and it's certainly not Joe Rogan. And, um, and so, you know, sometimes people just straight up turn you down. So, so with that said, um, in today's episode, I am going to get into the I wouldn't, you could call them disastrous. I will, let's call them disastrous. The disastrous post holiday results of my, uh, of my blood draw with, um, with COVID, as I'm sure a lot of you are experiencing, you know, people aren't going to the doctor as much. People aren't doing the normal things like, you know, blood draws, like, uh, different screenings and things like that. And so I haven't been getting my blood done quite as much, uh, over the last year as I normally would. But, um, you know, if you've, if you listen to previous episodes, I did an egg episode over the summer and, uh, late summer. And one of the things that I kind of touched on for the audience was, um, 
when I'm evaluating my blood work, the the way that I'm kind of seeing my, I guess you could say my phenotype is um, from a few different perspectives. One of which is that I have this hyperabsorption issue. So I carry these genetic markers for the hyperabsorption of cholesterol and the neiman pick one like protein and the ABCG5 and ABCG8 genes and this kind of pathway of the influx and efflux of cholesterol and sterile um, in, past the uh, gut wall into the bloodstream is a really interesting one um, because if you're hyperabsorbing plant sterile, you're also hyperabsorbing cholesterol. And um, one, of the, one of the ways that they measure for hyperabsorption of cholesterol aside from genetics is they look at your levels of uh, camposterol, cholestanol, and um, cetosterol. And there's a blood test at Boston Heart Diagnostics. I believe it's called their cholesterol balance test. And they measure for these sterile markers um, because if you have really high levels of cetosterol, then you can guess that if you're becoming dyslipidemic, that, you're, that that's happening because of the fact that you're hyperabsorbing. And then conversely, if you are uh, if you're if you're making a ton more cholesterol in response to a diet that's really high in saturated fat, you might be becoming dyslipidemic because of a synthesis issue. So you're eating a you know low carb, high fat diet. Let's say your body's making a ton more cholesterol, and you're seeing that show up in a bunch of your lipid markers, um, your LDL cholesterol, your ApoB. And if you have a physician that can utilize these tests, they can go and they can say, okay, well, I see that your LDL cholesterol or your ApoB or your particle count is really high, and your dismosterol and your lathosterol are really high as well. Those are the molecules at the first step of the pathway that the body uses to produce cholesterol. And they can say, okay, well, it looks like your synthesis is ramped up. And those are the, those are the patients who are probably destined for some kind of statin therapy because the statins, are, statins do um, increase to a degree the LDL receptor activity on the liver, but they also slow down the overall synthesis of cholesterol. And one of the things that I've learned from interviewing Tom Dayspring and um, kind of being in the uh, Peter Atiyah sphere in terms of the lipid knowledge that, his, that he and his community are sharing, which is really interesting, is that what they tell a lot of these people who go on a statin to look for after they've been on a statin is they tell them to go have their dismosterol retested because if it goes to zero, then that means that you basically not, not have, you've, you've not only blunted the synthetic process in the body where you're making cholesterol, but you've, you, you may have put it at zero and that's probably not healthy um, or necessary in a lot of cases. And so these sterile panels can be done and redone to see if an intervention is working. In my case, you know, my dismosterol has always been pretty normal when I've had it tested. The thing that can go high is the cetosterol. And so, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it from this perspective of, okay, I'm prone to hyperabsorbing cholesterol, both the cholesterol that I'm eating and also the recirculating pool of cholesterol that my body's making continuously. And I have elevated LP little a, and I have noticed, although it, it stays within a range, that um, when I'm eating a lot of dietary cholesterol, it does seem to impact to a degree my LP little a numbers. Um, and my thesis there is that you have the hyperabsorption piece, you're bringing in more cholesterol. LP little a is a cholesterol rich particle. But there's also some interesting studies that have been done on LP little, LP little a by um, Sam Samikis, I believe is the, the physician's name. He's LP little a doc on Twitter. I can put this in the show notes. And he did a study a few years back that showed that um, that basically the oxidized phospholipid count sterile absorption mechanism could increase serum levels of LP little a. Um, and so when patients or subjects were put on a diet that was lower in um, phospholipids, their LP, LP little a saw modest drops. The problem that I had with that study was is that the the LP little a was dropping from like five milligrams per deciliter to four. So if you're somebody that has five milligrams per deciliter uh, of LP little a in a, in a blood sample, that's not somebody that's carrying the SNPs that are genetically predetermining and causing that individual to have higher genetically higher levels of LP little a um, like I do 
you know, like some people in my family do. So to set the table for my blood work here, hyperabsorber definitely can see myself become dyslipidemic, almost like a like a like a mild sort of like familial hypercholesteremia where you know, if I'm eating wrong, I'm not, and, and, and I'm, you know, especially a lot of dietary cholesterol, I will see my LDLC kind of, kind of creep up. It's never, it's never crazy high, but it, it creeps up to, you know, over like 110, 115, 119. And if I'm paying attention to what I'm eating, that it'll go back down a hundred, maybe a little bit less than a hundred. It'll be, you know, within range. And the same is true of my ApoB and particle count. When I'm really on my game, I've had some times where I've put my particle count below a thousand concordant with my ApoB count, just diet and lifestyle alone. Funny thing is, is in some of those instances, I've also had really elevated levels of cetosterol, um, but it was because I had cut out, uh, I, I believe it was because I had cut out dietary cholesterol and I was eating a lot of nut butters. So against that backdrop, I'm seeing these days on the calendar where my numbers are looking really good and I'm probably in a, in a, in a place that's low risk and that's desirable. And I'm also seeing though, when I, my lifestyle goes off the rails as it does, you know, during Christmas and new year's as it did this year where my blood can look terrible. And I had a post that I published about a year ago where I shared the results of my blood. I went in and had my blood drawn the morning after eating literally the morning after of drinking a ton of mezcal with friends and eating a lot of pizza and my blood just looked absolutely awful, right? And um, my gene food diet type is California coastal. So if you take these two sort of like macro level phenotypes of heart disease, which is you can have somebody who has really severe familial hypercholesteremia, FH, and they're getting dyslipidemic to the cholesterol side of the fence. So they come into a blood draw and their physician looks at their blood and they have like no small dense LDL. They have, you know, their VLDL is super low. Their trigs are super low, but they have crazy high LDL cholesterol. And then they have crazy high ApoB because of essentially a ton of cholesterol rich particles. It's like this genetic thing. So it's like, you know, this sort of stereotypical statinized population, heart disease runs in the family and they just have high cholesterol. And then you have this other phenotype, which is the Tim Russert phenotype of heart disease. You guys remember Tim Russert from a much, in my opinion, better days of, you know, kind of our, our media environment and much sort of, uh, I don't know, just a, a nostalgic for that time. He's super professional broadcaster, um, reporter, journalist, and he famously and tragically is the host of Meet the Press, but he tr famously and tragically had a heart attack and passed away. And what they found when they looked at his blood was that he had very low LDL cholesterol. I don't know whether he'd been placed on a statin or not, but he had really high levels of small dense LDL, uh, triglycerides, VLDL, all of these particles that are the phenotype number two, which is um, people that become basically dyslipidemic because of sugar, type two diabetes, sort of like metabolic syndrome. And, um, and so I'm kind of a combination of all of those things. You have the absorption, you have the LP little a, a little bit of that FH I mentioned. And if I'm blowing out these pathways and just eating terribly, which I was, you know, I'll see the trigs and, and like the small dense LDL increase as well. So if you break down the blood, the blood lipid panel, I'm going to do this. I'm going to kind of disclose these really kind of bad results. And then I'm going to do a follow-up episode and talk about some of the changes that I made and see if I can't get um, these markers back in range. But my diet, you know, during the holidays, you know, it's a lot of booze, a um, lot of sugar, just it, basically just eating anything and everything, ice cream, cakes, cookies, you know, and, um, and, and, and just kind of, just kind of letting it loose, you know, for the, for the holidays, especially this year with COVID with things being um, just in, in an additional state of stress. And, um, and so my total cholesterol, what does my total cholesterol look like? Usually my total cholesterol is, you know, I don't know, 180, 190, 170, maybe it might creep up, you know, one in the 190s. So I blew that out to 248. So my total cholesterol was 248 milligrams per deciliter. Um, my HDL cholesterol was 80, trigs of 157. So you basically have a, you basically have a trig to HDL ratio of two, which, which really honestly is not terrible. But, um, you know, having had the, the luck and the opportunity to interview uh, Tom Dayspring, um, 
and, and being, you know, aware of some of the people on our team doing, having a chance to read some of this HDL research, like I think it's the Picasso trial and some of these studies where they've um, inhibited uh, CTAP, inhibited the ability of HDL to basically pass on uh, it's, it's a cholesterol payload to LDL particles and looked at all these different ways to manipulate HDL. And what they found is that HDL cholesterol, it doesn't have in and of itself, independent of other markers like, like ApoB, it just doesn't have a clinically significant risk reduction action on people from, from what studies can find. And so, you know, my job is here is, look, it's just to kind of we have a research. We have a small research team, and our job is to synthesize some of these studies as it pertains to nutrition. Talk about them with you know people like you who are interested in listening to these kind of technical nerdy conversations, and just sort of pass on what we think the best resources out there are saying, what the best medical journals out there are saying, and what the best trials have said. And you know, I've even seen um, Dr. Khan, who's a who's a friend and who's been on the podcast, tweet and and say, look, I mean, you almost wonder whether you even need to be measuring HDL cholesterol anymore. Look, my HDL was super high. Do I think that that's protective? No, I don't think it's protective. And the reason why is because, look, I'm sitting there with the trig of 157. My LDL cholesterol goes up to 139, um, and those two markers trig LDL cholesterol show up in my ApoB number, which is at 121 milligrams per deciliter, which is really high. The last test I did, I was at 87. Um, my particle count was 1,942. My small dense was 632. So in the moderate range, but very high for me. Usually my small dense LDL is, is not even measurable. And, um, and so what I take away from looking at something like the small dense LDL, the triglycerides, the cholesterol going up, LDL cholesterol going up, and having that be concordant with my ApoB number is that you have these two assaults that are coming simultaneously. And this is a simple, this is an oversimplification, but two assaults that are coming si simultaneously. One is you're having some combination of making more cholesterol and absorbing more cholesterol. And as you eat more cholesterol as a hyperabsorber, that's going to show up in your, in your blood lipid panel. And I was definitely eating a lot of dietary cholesterol. And then number two is at the same time, I was giving my body way more sugar and way more carbohydrate than it needed. And mechanistically, this is one of the places where I run into a little bit of a conceptual roadblock. I, I, I think that the pathway and the mechanism here is de, de novo lipogenesis. I believe that that's correct. So it's, I'm not that active, you know, I'm not, um, using a lot of glycogen or using a lot of the glucose that I eat. My body's stored it up. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's my glycogen stores are full. I'm not giving the, my body a, a reason to have to activate uh, glycogen in the muscles. And so once that bank of carbohydrate fuel is full, the body starts converting that, uh, that sugar into triglycerides. It starts converted into fat and that shows up in the blood. Um, and it makes its way into these particles. And so I have, in my blood work, I have, I've contributed to two sides of that ApoB. That the ApoB is the total, the total count of all the atherogenic particles that could be circulating in the body. So it's not just your LDL, but it's also VLDL, um, small dense LDL, IDL, LP little a. And so that's why a lot of physicians like Alan Snyderman are big advocates of uh, testing for ApoB above almost all else um, because of the fact that it accounts for all of the potential bad actors that could be circulating. So I've got, I've got those ApoB 100 particles that are carrying uh, you know, a lot of excess fatty acids. They're carrying cholesterol. They're carrying sterol. And the fact that there's a decent number of small dense LDL means that a good number of them have the potential to oxidize, um, to be damaged, and are uh, even more atherogenic than the larger buoyant particles. And I think one of the reasons why um, the small dense LDL are more atherogenic than some of the larger dense particles, although if you talk to Tom Dayspring, he says, look, they may be more atherogenic, but they're all atherogenic, is because they express a protein uh, called APOC3, which basically acts to increase the residence time of, of that particle. So it 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 lives longer in circulation than some of these other particles. And therefore, as it lives longer, it has a greater time to be oxidized and to crash an artery wall and to deposit something there that shouldn't be there. So 
you know, I did have a couple things that that offset um, the the ApoB number, um, the the particle number, the cholesterol number, the LDL cholesterol number, and the trig number. Um, you know, my um, my VLDL still maintained low and my uh, trended low, and my VLDL size at forty four point six was uh, was viewed as being you know healthy. Also, my C reactive protein was very low at point four, but I think the lesson here, just taking a tour through that, through that blood test is that, you know, I've gone into um, cardiologist offices in the past, like in LA when I was really on my game and, you know, wasn't in this kind of a holiday mode and my blood looked great. And then they're testing and they're seeing that the cetosterol is elevated and they're thinking, well, that's your major danger point right there is your cetosterol. That's something that's abnormally elevated. It could even be bordering on cytosterolemia got to be careful with that. And I've tried taking Zetia and I wish I could take Zetia, um, but it's just something that I have an allergic reaction to. You know, I have a family member, a close family member who was eating the pretty much the exact same diet that I was eating and even worse during this Christmas time who had tried Zetia previous prior to the holidays going on and was able to put her blood uh, work, her blood work looked gorgeous after this just with the one intervention of Zetia, which is pretty incredible. So they, but they want to isolate it down and say, okay, well, if you, if you take Zetia, you're fine. Or, you know, it's this, it's this cetosterol issue. But what I've learned by getting a ton of blood tests done is that you live in different neighborhoods blood test wise. So sometimes based on your lifestyle, your stress, what you're eating, what you're drinking, what you're smoking, your blood's going to look a certain way. And sometimes you can get it dialed in, especially with a regimen that's more personalized and it looks great. And the question basically becomes, how much time can you spend in those good neighborhoods with your blood in its best shape? Because the longer you can spend in those neighborhoods, the greater chance you're going to have of maintaining, you know, a a health span that that extends out um, to a place where you want it to be. And the longer that you're kind of hanging out in a, in a neighborhood, like I'm hanging out right here, you know, during Christmas, that's, it's just, it's just unhealthy. I mean, having an ha- having an ApoB count that high and having your particle count that high, um, it's it's uh it's not a controversial point that it's unhealthy. And you know, I've even listened lately to there's a lot of and I'm not going to name names because there's no that's not what I'm about. I don't want to do that. But I I've listened to podcasts and interviews lately where some of the most vocal and adamant influencers in the nutrition space are walking around with biomarkers that are that are absolutely high risk based on you know some notion of biohacking or some you know new science that uh that's been discovered in like the podcast and the blogosphere world and are also walking around with really high calcium scores and um and and i'll tell you what um over the long term it's 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 that's it's not the play so I guess if I have a message here, I'm just being open and honest about how my blood doesn't look great, but, um, but it changes, is that I think at the end of the day, uh, when it comes to nutrition and biomarkers, we need to respect the biomarkers. Um, you know, it's not just your small dense LDL. It's not just your trig to HDL ratio. It's not just whether you have large buoyant fluffy particles or, you know, smaller, denser um, particles. All of these metrics add up over time, not in, not in the short term, but in the long term to something that looks like either improved health, better health, better longevity or something that doesn't. And, um, and I think one of the really cool things about, uh, lifestyle and personalized nutrition regimens is that they can help people get a framework for understanding why, when, and how their, um, their system gets out of balance. And that's what we're trying to do at gene food. And, um, you know, presumably that's what they're, what they're, uh, doing at the Cleveland clinic. And we're going to try to do more of it in the new year. And, um, we're going to have Kristen on the podcast soon. And I really appreciate you listening and, um, happy new year. And we'll see you soon on a future show. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. The Gene Food Podcast is our attempt to synthesize the latest developments in the fields of genetics, nutrition, and medicine, and offer you practical tips and stories you can use in your own unique health journey. 
If you enjoy this podcast, you can find more information online at mygenefood.com.